Brainergy, a brand new term coined especially for TEDx. So why Brainergy? Well, because the brain uses a lot of energy. Uh, can I move? Yes. Um, it's actually uh, an organ that uses only... Uh, okay. As it's only 2% of the body mass, and yet it uses about one quarter of uh, the... Um, of the energy consumed by the body. Now, what is uh, consuming so much energy uh, in the brain? Well, it's actually a lot compared to the rest of the body, but not that much in terms of its computing power. Our brain, which is pretty good for most of us in producing uh, a very uh, complicated uh, calculations and computations, only... Can I go back? I don't know. Back one, only uses 20 watts. I mean, imagine that the computers today, they consume terawatts. And so one of the key uh, questions today is to develop uh, neuro-inspired, brain-inspired computers, which can also consume uh, very little energy to uh, provide uh, amazing uh, computational power. Now, the brain contains neurons. You all know that, about 100 billion. Uh, they are organized uh, very s similarly uh, one to, uh, from one another with a, a, a cell body, a, an area where they receive uh, uh, information and areas where they provide uh, signals. Now, uh, this, the, the, what consumes energy is actually the signaling uh, of the neurons. Neurons produce uh, electrical signals within... Uh, the neuron themselves, what is called the action potentials, and then they consume also uh, chemical energy. They use chemical signals and consume energy when they communicate uh, between each other at the synapse. So these two events use a lot of energy. But why uh, are they uh, consuming energy? Well, it's, uh, one should see neurons like batteries. They use currents in uh, normal electricity that you use at home, uh, the power is uh, carried by electrons. In the brain, in neurons, is carried by ions. And they go across the cell membrane, and one needs to recharge the batteries, redistribute the ions from one side and the other side of the membrane. And this process of recharging the battery is the one that consumes energy. Now, where do the neurons take their energy? Well, like any organ, they take it from the blood increasing blood flow, in using glucose utilization, uh, using glucose and uh, oxygen. Well, the brain is an amazingly vascularized organ, 600 kilometers of, brain, of blood vessels that carry energy to uh, the brain. But it's not only about neurons and blood vessels. There is a need to connect the two to uh, provide the energy when the neurons need it and where they need it. And this uh, type of cells, which were discovered uh, in the middle of the 19th century by a German scientist, are the cells that, among other things, connect neurons and blood vessels. These are the glial cells, also known uh, as glue. It was thought initially that this was just some glue that would keep the neurons together. Now, these cells, as you can see, they're very nice. They are star-shaped, hence their name. Uh, this is a type of glial cell, the astrocytes. And what these cells do is to connect, as I said, uh, blood vessels to, to neurons. So now we have a nice picture here. The neuron, the blood vessel, the source of energy, the user of energy, and these cells connect the two. And these cells can detect when neurons are active and suck up, bring more energy to the neurons where it's needed and when it's needed. Now, interestingly, uh, what these cells do, these astrocytes, they, pro they provide energy under a form which is quite surprising. It's lactate. And, you know, lactate is thought of being a bad stuff. But in fact, the brain, the neurons can use it. And without going into any particular detail, uh, it's, it's a very smart way of getting energy because uh, it can be readily used in, when there is oxygen around. So 
The brain can bring energy from the blood vessels thanks to the glial cells when needed and where needed. Now, this lactate is interesting because uh, it may not only provide energy, it seems to play also roles in protecting neurons and in uh, playing roles in, in uh, memory. Now, this is the basic science part, and uh, we, uh, it's important to connect basic science to uh, clinically relevant issues. And in fact, brain energy or brain energy actually is related to functional uh, brain imaging because these properties of coupling, when neurons are active, they bring in, they are able to bring in energy, is actually at the basis of the techniques that allow us to see a brain at work. So I think you're all familiar with this kind of images, uh, where you, for example, when you look at words, you have uh, this part of the brain, the visual cortex that is activated. When you're listening, like now, there are other parts of the brain that are active, uh, as I do now speak, it's even other brains. So now it's other brain areas. So now it's possible to visualize brain network. But what really do we visualize with these techniques? Well, it's energy utilization. The brain is like a muscle. Whenever uh, a given part of the brain, the neurons in a given part of the brain are more uh, active through the mechanism that I just described, they will have more energy to consume. And really, this is what the functional brain imaging techniques that are widely used now in research, in clinical research and in the clinical setting, that's what these techniques show. And uh, essentially, what they, you can see with these techniques, here is another image, is how much glucose is used in an area when a given area is more active, how much oxygen, how much blood flow gets there. You can also have other... Uh, indices, in the indices of, of uh, metabolism. But essentially, these functional brain imaging techniques detect signals that are related to energy consumption. Now, this means that when one looks at uh, this kind of image, li uh, that, like the one I just uh, show you, uh, showed you a moment ago, uh, this is really due to this mechanism that allows to couple the activity, the electrical and chemical activity of neurons with uh, bringing in more energy. And this has applications, for example, uh, in Alzheimer's disease, one can monitor glucose utilization. Of course, in advanced stages, when a lot of neurons are lost, uh, the signals are very small. Here you see a lot of green and very little red. Red meaning that the neurons are using considerable energy. But in cases where there are still um, uh, doubts about whether there will be um, uh, an evolution of the disease towards um, uh, Alzheimer's, for example, there, one can have already early signs of decreased energy metabolism. This would be a lot of red, you see. This is the control subjects. And these are subjects that may be vulnerable for the disease. So this is just an example of an application of uh, these functional brain imaging techniques. There is a usual and a common notion that we only use 10% of, of our brain. Well, this is actually incorrect. We use our brain, in fact, all the time, essentially, and all our brain. Uh, our brain is like an engine that would run at 6,000 RPMs and then in certain places at a certain time goes up to 7,000 RPM. And how can you detect this? Well, this again is thanks to uh, functional brain imaging. You here have the consumption, the utilization of glucose. You see some red and some yellow. Red always more energy consumed. This is baseline, the ears are closed, the eyes are closed. This is just what one would see, brain, whatever rest means. And here is activation. You stimulate very strongly uh, with a visual stimulus, and the part of the brain that will be activated is this posterior area, the visual cortex. And you can see that the differences are not that great. You subtract this basi basal uh, utilization from the activated one, and then you have then these nice pictures. But this we knew. What is interesting is that a lot of energy is used when the brain is, quote-unquote, at rest. So one of the big questions now is to try to understand why and what is the significance of this basal uh, energy utilization by the brain. Uh, in a way, <coughs> what we see with these activation studies is like 
the, the tip of the iceberg, and this being the basal activity of the brain. And now we should consider possibly two, based on these two modes of functioning of our brain. One which is online, when we are stimulated, we process information online. And then another mode of activity, which is uh, what one could call, and has been called in some, um, uh, in some uh, considerations, the default mode, a mode of the brain which is offline. When the brain is not focusing specifically on something, when one does not receive specifically uh, inputs from the environment. And I have to say that in our current society, we are probably much too much online and not enough offline. I mean, you look at the television screen, you see someone who's speaking, and then you um, have even some text that is running at the bottom of the screen, and then possibly someone even, another image comes in. So we, uh, we are, people have uh, um, iPods uh, listening to music all the time. So probably our society is uh, putting our brain under a lot of on pressure online, and I think it would be quite wise to revert to, a, or at least to give our brain more time to be offline. And probably this uh, basal brain uh, energy utilization has a lot to tell us uh, today. So why, what could be the, the reasons for this uh, high basal energy utilization by the brain. One possibility is that uh, the neurons in the brain globally fall into two categories, excitatory and inhibitory. In a way like in a car, the accelerator and the brain, uh, and, the, and the brake. Now imagine that both acceleration and brake are active at the same time. You, uh, you press on the accelerator, and of course you will use gas, and at the same time you brake, so you don't move, nothing happens. And then suddenly you remove uh, the brake and the car actually starts very rapidly. So one idea is that our brain is continuously in many, many areas using the brake at the same time as the accelerator and that provides uh, a fast possibility of response. But of course it has a cost, it will cost a lot of energy. Another possibility is that, uh, as you probably know now, our brain uh, uh, is, uh, undergoes continuous remodeling, uh, which uh, in great part allows to uh, organize experience, to create memories. Now, when we are online, it's, it's pretty straightforward. The, uh, the systems are stimulated, neurons are activated, the potentials that I mentioned earlier uh, create uh, some energy demands and energy uh, is uh, utilized. But in fact, uh, as I mentioned earlier, uh, there is also this offline mode and in fact plasticity, in other words the changes that occur within the neuronal systems to allow for memories to be created probably consume, I mean certainly consume energy and they do this not necessarily when the brain is online. So there is an ongoing utilization of energy just to establish, consolidate, modify possibly uh, the, our memories through the mechanisms of plasticity. So that's another uh, way of thinking of why our brain uses so much energy under basal conditions. And then finally, uh, one can uh, consider two, another way of defining two ways of brain function, a conscious one and an unconscious one. And some of these unconscious functions uh, may be just the vegetative states, the fact that you know, we don't have to think to breathe, we don't have to send commands to our um, uh, neurons that uh, regulate heartbeat or modulate heartbeat. All this is automatic, so we are not aware of it, but they, again, these are neurons, they will use energy. But also, and this is more debatable, there may be also an unconscious uh, activity uh, of uh, our brains. It's been studied under different forms in, in psychiatry, in psychoanalysis, but that this unconscious processing, unconscious life, also mobilizes neuronal systems which will uh, use energy because of the very principles that I have outlined at the beginning of, uh, of the presentations. So in summary, brain energy brain energy metabolism is uh, a way to look, it's a window uh, on the brain 
that allows, first of all, to see uh, brain at work, to see when in certain diseases changes in uh, brain functions occur, but also it provides us a window to better understand some of the basic aspects of brain functions, consciousness, unconscious, and uh, also a, a large array, as I said, of uh, brain pathologies. Thank you.